Hello, I'm Dr. David Johnson, Professor of Medicine and Chief of Gastroenterology at Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, Virginia. Well, the symptoms of abdominal bloating and distension are quite prevalent in, in people, not much less, even more so in patients, and they're clearly bothersome and more profound as it relates to the individual associations, but we know in the general population, without patient identification per se with a disease, about one in seven persons experience symptoms of bloating each week. Now, it's important to delineate bloating from distension. So distension is clearly an objective and visible increase in the abdominal girth. I've had patients come in with pictures where postprandially all of a sudden they look like they're extremely pregnant. And bloating in the other circumstance really is talking about a gaseous sensation. Now, although patients can describe one or the other, they're not mutually exclusive, and approximately 50% or so of patients with bloating also have this abdominal distension. Uh, in particular, we see it more in the brain-gut interaction uh, type of associations like functional constipation, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, functional dyspepsia. And these are things that clearly have a differential way beyond today's discussion, but you need to think about other causes before you work on the, the causes that we'll talk about here related to gaseous uh, distension. But things like malabsorption, maldigestion, celiac disease, dysbiosis, uh, insufficiency or motility disorders, those are, again, in the differential for an astute clinician to exclude before thinking about this potential uh, causality of postprandial distension. So what happens in the normal circumstance is an intraluminal digestion or ingestion triggers a distension, particularly in the stomach, but in the small intestine as well. And it triggers a, a series of events that lead to a, a relaxation of the diaphragm and an ascent. Basically, you're making the abdominal cavity larger to accommodate the distension that, that's related to the ingestion. And you have a concomitant reflex contraction of the abdominal muscles, so you minimize or limit any of that distension-related uh, consequence of abdominal girth. Now, when these are disjoint and then there's a maladaptive response, this is called abdominal phrenic dysinergia. So the normal circumstance, we'd see the diaphragm relax, the, the abdominal muscles contract, and this is a, a, a physiologic event that is called, uh, it's called uh, abdominal accommodation. So again, we have a built-in way to protect against that distension. When that maladaption occurs, it's called abdominophrenic dysinergia. You may have heard about this, and we've discussed this previously, and the, the event here is something that can be quite dramatic because it's typical that it occurs postprandially. The peak event of maximal distension occurs about 45 minutes after a meal. So enter in this very provocative randomized control trial that was done in Spain where they looked at potential biofeedback for abdominal distension. So they looked at patients. They, they basically took a group of predominantly women. There were... There were uh, 38 women and six uh, uh, six men, and basically they looked at these and the consequence of entry and exclusion. They lost a couple patients, so they ended up with 42 patients in the uh, in the final analysis. And the randomization then was done with an intervention based on a biofeedback technique. So these patients came in, they were trained over a course of three separate episodes, abdominal plethysmography, and they looked at the event that they were trying to generate which was rather than chest go down and abdomen go out, which is much what we talk about in diaphragmatic breathing. We'll come back to that in a second. But the consequence here that we're trying to mitigate against is get the chest up, diaphragmatic relaxation, and abdominal contraction. So chest up, abdomen in was really the training point. They had plethysmosic type belts to teach them this. And then they were all sent back over a course of a four-week interval with the assessment ultimately at the end of four weeks. Dramatic improvement uh, over the course of uh, the patients. Only one in the active group did not respond, and th the improvements were uh, over two thirds in the patients that had abdominal distension scores and their visible distension that was evident based on, on measurements. Virtually all the patients learned the technique of chest up and, and abdomen tight, uh, and even the patients that were then in the placebo group were allowed to cross over and all but one of those patients also responded. That patient, one patient lost a follow-up, but they had the same effect. At the end of six months, these seemed to be durable effects. They attributed these interventions to five minutes before and 
five minutes after a meal, and this is done for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Really, there's no downside for this. Now, again, these, again, were patients that were not with other provocative type of problems, which might account for abdominal cessation. So all the women were done in the follicular phase of their, their cycle. So it's five to 15 days after the onset of their last menstrual period. They were not on uh, any type of uh, psychological or psychotic type medications, and that these patients also were non-constipated. So again, some of the normal relative uh, things to exclude were, were part of this. I think overall, it becomes a very provocative study and a very easy technique. I don't know, even though it was done with complex plethysmography and those type things, to train these patients chest up, abdomen in, um, and training them very different than what we do with diaphragmatic breathing, which is really different because it's it's chest stays in diaphragm. I call it belly breathing, and, and belly breathing means your abdomen goes out, and the relaxation of abdominal uh, uh, muscles, but this is a consequence. It's different. So again, we need to differentiate when we start to talk about this, and some of us have tried diaphragmatic breathing for, for this abdominal uh, phrenic dyssynergia. Again, mixed results, but I think we have now a much more directive approach Again, I think abdominal phrenic dyssynergia is different than where we would treat with uh, with diaphragmatic breathing conditions that are very good to treat that are rumination syndrome is pretty much the, the first approach. Uh, singultus, uh, hiccups, uh, uh, patients with chronic belching, I, I've had uh, really excellent success in those, but again, different approach here. So simple, easy, teach your patients uh, with this article uh, comes a very simple video, and I would invite you all to take a quick look at this. I'll see if I can hot link in this, and I'll also hot link to you back the uh, diaphragmatic breathing discussion we had so far. Simple things in brain gut disorder type approaches, but this one may be revolutionary and certainly is way overdue as something that we can really ascribe by evidence. Certainly need to see more studies to corroborate this, but I see no downside that maybe we could start looking at this or patients right now. Dr. David Johnson, thanks again for listening.